Hello and welcome to this Awesome Astronomy Podcast Extra about the recent paper on the Hubble tuning fork and galaxy classification. This was a story that intrigued us at Awesome because it's a fantastic example of citizen science and a major change in astronomy in an area that has been accepted science for almost a century. Joining me to discuss this is Karen Masters, Associate Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Haverford College with a partial affiliation to the Institute of Cosmology and Gravitation at the University of Portsmouth. Professor Karen Masters, welcome to Awesome Astronomy. This is about, I think I can honestly say this was quite a surprise announcement. I didn't see this one coming. So this, this of course, is about the tuning fork, I suppose, is, 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 the, is the kind of familiar anchor that I think everyone will know about. It's Hubble's tuning fork, and that actually we should probably bin it, I suppose. What happened? but just be aware that how we put galaxies on it has changed over time. This is actually something we've been sort of, we've been sort of, no, I'm not going to say sitting on it, but we've known about this for a little while with the Galaxy Zoo classifications. And we sort of saw it a few years ago and we were sort of like, huh, that's strange. And then that's a really interesting place to be in research, mm, but it's mm. also a place where you want to do a lot of checking, right? Because yeah. we, I, I sort of knew, you know, it's, it's, relatively big deal we're sort of disagreeing with something that's been it's in every textbook yeah and so you know you want to make sure you get it right and then uh so we did a lot of extra work there are a number of other papers on similar topics and then finally we decided we we're confident to sort of publish this but the bottom line is that when hubble published his tuning fork he said that spirals get placed on this sequence on the basis of two main properties the size of their central bulge which is a central bright bit in the galaxy and how tightly wound the spiral mm. arms are and Hubble said that correlated very well, so that galaxies with big bulges had tightly wound arms, and those with small bulges had loose arms. Um, and if you dig through the literature, you find all kinds of people classifying on the basis of the arms, because mm -hmm. they're really obvious visually, yeah. um, and putting things on, on that sequence. What we found was there's no correlation in a big sample. And, and more than that, I think for astrophysicists, more than that, people are putting galaxies on the sequence on the basis of their bulge size. So they're putting them, it's all scrambled relative to how mm. Hubble did it you know, almost 100 years ago now. Yes. Um, uh, see, yeah. It's, I say this is, I mean, something when I, when I studied astronomy, this, this was part of the degree was to classify pictures of, yeah. of galaxies and actually yeah. try and put them in that, that framework. And when I think back to how I did it, I think, yeah, actually, when I was reading the paper, I was thinking, yeah, how did I do it? When I was looking at all these pictures, yeah. what, what was I actually doing trying to fit it? And I think I was actually fitting it into the model rather than looking at what was in front of me and i suppose yeah. that's what this is saying isn't it that there's actually this this correlation isn't quite quite right yeah and in galaxy zoo that was quite a deliberate choice when we asked people to help us classify galaxies that we weren't saying please put them on this classification sequence mm. we are asking descriptive questions so if you look at the questions it's like how big is the bulge how tightly wound mm. are the arms all of them are sort of separate and that's why we're able to sort of find this or, or make this measurement and then, you know, then we have to do a lot of checks and make sure that, that we're able to get good visual estimations of these features in the galaxies. And we're now very confident of that. Mm. Um, and so that's why we published the result. How, how long did this take before you were, you, huh. you said you sort of sat on it for a while. I mean, how, how long was a while? I mean, I think the first draft of the paper was in 2014. Wow. I mean, that's not just the sort of waiting to be sure that it's right that's also things like you know careers and jobs and other mm. responsibilities and research can take a long time because of all of that stuff um it really it really needed there was a phd student at nottingham called ross hart he graduated um last year and his thesis was really looking a lot at the spiral arm measurements in galaxy zoo and it really needed all of that enormous amount of work that yeah. he did for us to sort of be like, oh, no, actually, we've got a really good measurement of how tightly wound the arms are from Galaxy Zoo. So we can go with this. And, and like a lot of papers, they so say you mentioned Galaxy Zoo. This um, there's, uh, there's a lot of people that contribute to this paper. But in some ways, there is a lot of people that contribute to this paper because, of course, it's Galaxy Zoo. For, for those who don't know, yeah. what is Galaxy Zoo? 
Oh, right. So Galaxy Zoom is a, is a crowdsourcing project. It's a, it's a website. It's www.galaxyzoo.org. And you can go and look at images of galaxies and answer a series of simple questions about them. And what we do behind the scenes is we collect those data, those answers, from sort of 40-ish people per mm-hmm. galaxy. That number changes a bit. But, and then we make a consensus answer. Um, and we've shown, it's been running for more than 10 years now, we've shown that our, those classifications we get from that consensus method are, you know, as good as mm. any other way of getting morphology better in some cases, I think. So, yeah, so there's a, there's a whole lot of people contribute to this paper through the classifications. One thing, one fun thing, actually, was we had a little side project where we invited people who classify um, to read some astronomy papers and help us find mm. some examples of how people have applied the Hubble uh, classification. So... Uh, three three of the Galaxy Zoo volunteers are also listed as co-authors because they helped us uh, write mm-hmm. the paper and they, we acknowledge everyone, but... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a separate link to That's all the cool. people who did classification. And when you're reading on the paper, yeah. there's, there's like another paper of all these people that classified. It's fantastic. Yeah. The story goes that the very first Galaxy Zoo paper, we, I wasn't actually part of this at that one moment, but that the, they tried to submit it with everyone as a co-author. So it was like, you know, 20 pages of co-authors. <laughs> um, but the journal said that was not not okay. So we just had to go with acknowledgement. So this this lack of correlation, so basically what are you now saying that, that is, right. is being suggested? Well, so what's interesting is that the fact of a correlation, I guess I'm doing air quotes, the fact of a correlation was used to justify one particular model for how spiral arms form. And so... This was a long-standing problem. So the spiral arms in all these galaxies everywhere, and galaxies rotate. And so actually, if the spiral arms were a physical thing, if it was like a string, um, they'd wind up over time. Yeah. Um, and, and they'd kind of disappear. This is called the winding problem. And in the 60s, some people came up with a, an idea that, you know, they're not physical, they're a density wave. So that's mm. a bit like a traffic jam. Cars move in and out of the traffic jam, but yeah. you get that sort of over-density that you can see. And the, there's a, a very particular version of that called the static density wave model that predicts that pitch angle, that how wound up the arms are depends on how big the central mass is. Mm-hmm. So, it, you know, the fact, again, air quotes, that bulge <laughs> size and arm winding correlate was used to say, okay, most galaxies must be static density waves. It, now we see that, that that's not true. Then we think, you know, it's most galaxies are probably not static density waves. Turns out the modelers had kind of moved away from that anyway. It's a bit odd to think that it would be static. The sort of the traffic yeah. jam moves slowly around the galaxy. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. You can just models of that where bulge size and arm winding don't correlate. So it's still quite likely that a lot of these are density waves in some form. But we've now sort of lost one of these constraints on the model yeah. that, that was needed before. So the, the discussion in the paper says that potentially the arms do wind up. Yeah, uh, and yeah. The, the sort of the, the pattern breaks down after a while. They get tighter and tighter. Then, then it destroys, and then probably restarts. Yeah. What sort of time frame are we looking at for that sort of event? Well, they, yeah, they, they they sort of form on hundreds of millions of years mm-hmm. time scales. So it's a long time scale for humans. Galaxy time scales are billions of years. Yeah. So you know the universe is about fifteen billion years old. Galaxies. So have been around for many billions of years. So potentially yeah. the, the, the sort of spiral shape of, say, the Milky Way has formed, collapsed and reformed within its lifetime then? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't really think about it completely going away. Yeah. Um, it's more that, you know, a particular arm will wind up and another one is forming mm. kind of at the same time. Right, OK. okay. Um, if, you look, if you look out at spirals, most have two arms. Mm-hmm. But you do find them with like three or four, and you can see sort of bigger arms or older mm-hmm. arms mm-hmm. and minor arms. There's actually a lot of debate about the Milky Way, whether it has two arms or four. Yes. Because if you look at different ages of stars, you get different answers. And that, you know, again, could be telling mm-hmm. you that the arms themselves actually have different ages, right? So, yes, yeah, 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 that, that yeah. would make sense. In terms of like the, um, the, the bar... It was always that right. the, the bar seemed to suggest sort of looser arms and, and, and wider, yeah. wider. Is that still the case? Is, is there a correlation there or, or is, is, there, yeah. is this now changed as well? No, we did see, we did see that. The bars, uh, the galaxies that have bars did have looser arms mm. um, and much stronger two arm patterns as well. So bars, I think, do change how the arms are formed. So it seems much more, you know, much closer to the density wave model when you have a strong bar because mm-hmm. it's sort of stirring the pot almost yes. and driving these arms. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah, it is very. And, and yeah. what initially started this search? When, when you say sort of a while ago, you, you 
you sort of noticed if you what was the trigger for this project oh, i don't know i was probably just curious one day <laughs> occasionally go in and make a few plots of different morphology things against other things mm. a lot of the work i've done with galaxy zoo has been about the bars actually and i think maybe at some point i realized spiral arms were interesting too and it would be interesting to to have a look and see what we could quantify with the spiral arm mm. classifications we really feel quite strongly about making use of the classifications you know doing yeah. science with them so we're sort of always I'm, I, I'm i'm an observational astrophysicist that's what i would call myself i'm always looking for ways to test models mm. so if i read a paper that says a prediction I'm really like, oh, how could I test that? Sometimes you can think of ways to test it in Galaxy Zoo, so that's fun. If you wanted to get involved um, in Galaxy Zoo, how would you do that? Well, so we are collecting classifications right now, galaxyzoo.org. There's a couple of little uh, sort of side projects that we're working on that are close to my heart at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, We've got one going where you're actually tracing over spiral arms uh, for a set of galaxies where that will be useful because we can then use that to get spectra, get more information about Mm -hmm. the arms. Um, that's called Galaxy Zoo 3D. Um, all of these are part of the Zooniverse, which is a platform for citizen science projects. Mm. So if everyone just goes to zooniverse.org and yeah. look for the space projects, they should find these. They can find them there. Brilliant. So, Looking back at the, the sort of the, the Hubble tuning fork, so it's, it's not dead completely. This is you're, you're saying it's yeah. I don't. I don't think it's. I don't think it'll die. I just think we need to describe it more differently and say mm. that in the modern usage. The, the spiral sequence is to do with bulge size. That's how people are using it. Mm-hmm. Um, however, in the sort of traditional sequence, arm winding was folded in, and so people need to just be careful about c- not comparing apples and oranges, right? Yeah. Comparing different types of galaxies to each other. So, yeah. so should do you think this will eventually lead to a a, a different terminology? So they're sort of you know thinking of the SBCs and and SAs and things like that. Is is this going to lead to a redesign of that model in, in terms of how we talk about what, what a galaxy is and what type? Maybe it'll be part of that. I think we're moving... I mean, what we're trying to get at with morphology is the way the stars are moving in the galaxy. Mm-hmm. So sort of like the motion. And, you know, spiral galaxies are disks that are rotating and elliptical galaxies are blobs. Um, and I imagine that we're more likely to move towards a more like physical classification. So it's mm-hmm. not just looking at the image, but information yeah. you know if we could measure information about how the stars are moving that's how we want to classify a galaxy we can't do that for as many galaxies as we like at the moment and so we're kind of um using morphology as a way mm. of getting at that um but if we're going to completely make a new classification we should do it on a new type of you know a new way of classifying yes yeah, someone someone but, said to me the other yeah. the, the sort of the other day talking about this that it feels like it's it's the change that happened in biology when they went from visually just looking at creatures to then actually realizing that there was DNA that related different different yeah. um, creatures in in different ways that weren't obvious from their their sort of visual characteristics. Is is that yeah? Is that a good analogy? That was that we were trying to work out if that was a good analogy or not. Um, we should be a bit careful though, because so with an, in the animal world there is an answer, there is a type that that an hmm. animal is. Galaxies. I personally think galaxies are much more of a continuum than a set of boxes. So I like to think of morphology as a continuum. Mm -hmm. There's one other another reason I really like the Galaxy Zoo way of doing it because we do we don't put them in boxes. We put them on a continuum of properties. Yeah. So that's why I'm not so keen on the biology analogy. But Mm. but going back to it, though, it is about getting into like the actual physics or the actual sort of the mechanism that causes the differences you see. So I guess in that sense, yeah, if you can get more directly at the mechanism that, that mm-hmm. makes those mm-hmm. differences, that would be a better way of classifying. If you had to, I say guess, but how how are spiral arms formed? Huh. Um, I think that every model that has correct physics happens somewhere in the universe. Wow. So there's a okay. galaxy somewhere that forms with spiral arms that formed using every method you can think of that that actually works there are enough of them i suppose that's um yeah yeah so i think probably most of them are this sort of swing amplified so the the model where they 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 kind of they pop up as small densities they get amplified Mm -hmm. as density waves they're slowly moving density waves that slowly wind up and then that just keeps continuously happening Mm -hmm. um but then you've got you know tidal triggering drives these really big density waves like in the whirlpool galaxy bars drive big density waves and then there's clearly ones where it's all flocculent it's a lovely word (laughs) flocculent (laughs) stochastic star formation where it's all just sort of bubbling up and winding around that's my phrase Um, of the day i think (laughs) it's a big universe so there's probably there's one of every type 
where where does this leave the sort of relationship between spirals and ellipticals and irregulars? Because I think slowly over time, the 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 tuning forks people have mistaken it as an evolutionary diagram. So so curiously, to make an to make an elliptical, we actually think you need many many mergers. If you just sort of collide two spirals you're not really going to lose enough angular momentum. So they're sort of orbiting each other. Yeah. And so you, you can end up actually with an elliptical that looks quite like a disk galaxy, just a bigger one, eventually being like, you know, hundreds of millions of years. <laughs> but if, you know, if this happens repeatedly, you do, everything will get scrambled and you end up with a giant elliptical. Mm-hmm. We still think that's happening, absolutely. It, it's not the case that every single spiral galaxy is going to end up in an, as an elliptical yeah. though, yeah. because that's going to depend on where they are in the universe mm-hmm. and, you know, the other things that are happening to them. And then irregulars are always such a weird mixed bag, right? Really low mass galaxies yeah. can be irregular just because they haven't, they don't have enough gravity to kind of make them smooth and nice patterns and set up spiral arms and stuff. But we also call mergers while they're going on irregulars, so, uh, or can do, so. To, to finish, what's your favourite galaxy? Oh, I'm really a big fan of the Whirlpool Galaxy. That's my favourite. It is beautiful, isn't First it? First one where the spiral structure was recorded. Professor yeah. Cara Masters, thank you very much. It's been really interesting. Yeah, the pleasure. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening and from Cydonia Base, end of transmission.